Welcome to LSU Press's remote author series. I'm Sarah Glosson, author of Performing Jane, a cultural history of Jane Austen fandom. I was so pleased to be asked by LSU Press to present on this Facebook Live series to help celebrate the release of Performing Jane. Um, in this house, at least, we would refer to this as the book's birthday eve because it is being released tomorrow, June 10th. So thank you for joining me to celebrate the birthday eve of uh, Performing Jane. I'd like to thank everyone at LSU Press for helping to make this possible. Um, I'd like to thank LB Kovac for arranging the event and uh, a special shout out to um, my absolutely amazing editor, Jenny Keegan, editor extraordinaire at LSU Press. I've been incredibly fortunate to work with her. Um, and I would like to give a shout out to the design team at LSU. This is absolutely one of the most beautiful academic books I have ever seen. and. I'm sure I'm biased, but bravo to everybody. It's a really beautifully designed book. Um, I'm honored to be sharing the stage, so to speak, here on Facebook with some other really terrific authors who have been on this series. I'd highly recommend checking out some of the others uh, archived here and those that are coming up. If you're interested in more about fandom, Ashley Hink did a reading several weeks ago from her terrific book, Politics for the Love of Fandom. And coming up this Thursday is a talk, a uh, very timely talk by Thomas Aiello uh, from his, uh, a new edition of his book, Jim Crow's Last Stand. That's about uh, criminal jury uh, verdicts in Louisiana. So thank you again very much for being here. I just want to explain a little bit about the, f the format today. Um, I'm going to just describe the book a little bit talk about the book and introduce the chapter that I'm going to read from, and then I'm going to do a, a reading, some excerpts from one chapter in particular. And, um, and then at the, at the end, we should have some time for questions. You can put questions into the comment feature, the chat feature here on Facebook at, at any time during the talk, and then I'll, I'll go through them at the end. Uh, so in this book, In Performing Jane, I trace the long history of Jane Austen fandom, focusing really on three types of uh, ways that fans engage with and, and experience the literature that they love. So those three are really, that I focus on here, are collecting. That's sort of collecting materials, collecting even knowledge, scrapbooking, things related to Austin, uh, collecting books, other materials. The second activity is through writing and reading imitative works, things like spin-offs, fan fiction, and then watching adaptations and engaging with those. And the third main activity I, I grapple with in the book is pilgrimage, the, the travel to Austin-related sites to help bring one a little bit closer to Austin's world. All of these practices of fans really demonstrate remarkable continuity across the roughly 200-year history of, of Jane Austen fandom. And even as fandom has moved into online spaces, like here we are today, um, and while media environments have changed from analog to digital, the practices and the habits of these fans have remained remarkably stable. Throughout the book, I foreground um, the ways that performance and performativity, or what you might call the quality of performance-ness, um, how they make space for and really enable the desires and activities of fans. So today I'm going to read uh, for chapter nine. Chapter nine is called The Lizzie Bennet Diaries Adaptation and Social Media. Um, screen adaptations of Austin's works like The Lizzie Bennet Diaries really um, offer readers a common visual language, common visualization that allow for imagining settings and characters that they love. And these shared visualizations really help foster fan communities. This allows fans to take pleasure collectively in sharing a familiarity with visual language. Um, in the reading, I hope that you'll get a sense of, of one particular kind of performance. I talk about different kinds of performances in, in the book, but this one particular kind of performance that takes place through fan engagement with adaptations. Um, there's one term that I'm going to use toward the end of the chapter that I'd like to just give a little introduction to. The word is archontic, A-R-C-H-O-N-T-I-C. It's a bit of jargon from, from fan studies that will be fairly unfamiliar to most people outside of the field, so I wanted to explain it. Um, it's a word that we use in place of words like imitative or derivative to talk about spin-offs, fan fiction, 
um, other works that are related to Jane Austen but are not the original core novels. And the word really refers to the fact that, that all of these spin-offs and, and um, other works, adaptations, are all part of an archive, if you will, an archive of Jane Austen. And that over time, Jane Austen's novels have sort of accreted all of these other versions and that these versions don't exist in a vacuum. They really speak to each other. So that, that word will come up later. I just wanted to introduce it. And one other note, I am going to be um, uh, talking about comments from YouTube users in this chapter about the Lizzie Bennet Diaries. And because their handles, their screen names, tend to be words all smashed together, they don't read very well. So I'm just going to sort of generalize them and I just wanted to footnote that. Again, if you want to put questions in, um, I will be ignoring them while I read, but I will, I'll address questions toward the end. And uh, thank you again very much for being here. I'm seeing all kinds of uh, friends and family and colleagues. It's lovely to see you all. So the Lizzie Bennet Diaries, Adaptation, and Social Media. Beginning in April 2012, Pride and Prejudice was adapted for the small screen once again this time reimagined as a fictional video blog or vlog told from the perspective of a modern day Lizzie Bennet and released as a series of short videos on YouTube. A commercial example of transmedia storytelling, the Lizzie Bennet Diaries encapsulated the ways in which fan activities have influenced visual culture and how visual culture has influenced fan culture. Lizzie is a 24-year-old graduate student studying mass communication, living with her parents, and constrained not as much by society as by overwhelming student loan debt. Released twice per week on YouTube for nearly a year, the main narrative unfolded in a series of 100 episodes, each about three to seven minutes long. The story was augmented by supplementary segments and online content that appeared throughout the year, including vlogs made by characters other than Lizzie, Twitter accounts through which the characters communicated off screen, and websites related to fictional companies and entities presented in the main narrative. The 100 episodes that reveal the main narrative are set mostly in Lizzie's bedroom and later at her internship office where she has set up a camera to record herself discussing the goings-on in her life, ostensibly making the vlog for a graduate school project. The scene changes only occasionally, and the only action on screen occurs when other characters come and go from the room and join Lizzie, seated in front of the camera. The camera never moves, and the angle remains constant, so that if a character stands up, her head is no longer in frame, a visual conceit used occasionally to emphasize the awkwardness of interactions between Lizzie and Darcy and to lend the video's authenticity as a vlog, which typically use a stationary unmanned camera, as I am today, which we're all getting used to. The videos employ a style of editing frequently used by internet video bloggers in which multiple rapid edits break up a monologue to offer emphasis or comic effect. YouTube provides the platform through which the videos are delivered, but the conventions of its use also dictate the style of the narrative and influence the development of the plot. The plot of Pride and Prejudice is revealed as Lizzie shares her personal accounts of recent events with her internet audience, describing, for instance, visits with the new rich and handsome medical student in the neighborhood, Bing Lee, that's Austin's Charles Bingley, and the social events that occur at which the Bennett sisters get to know William Darcy. To keep the plot moving and to introduce new characters who have not yet appeared on screen, Lizzie and her two sisters play what they call costume theater, in which they each don a hat or other emblematic costume prop and portray other characters such as Darcy, represented by a bow tie and tweed cap, or Lizzie's mother represented by a gaudy church hat, pearls, and a scarf. In addition to the use of social media, the characters, settings, and plot are Americanized and modernized through inclusion of ethnic diversity among the characters and the insertion of contemporary feminist views. Many of the plot and settings updates cleverly allude to the original novel. Austen's version, for instance, of an accomplished woman 
is replaced with a notion of what makes a young woman seem together. Lizzie and Georgiana Darcy get to know each other at a karaoke bar instead of at the pianoforte. Mr. Darcy is wealthy because of the success of his family business, Pemberley Digital, which, is, which shares its name with the actual production company that created the series. And the threat of poverty that worries Lizzie's mother is not the pressure of archaic entailment laws, but financial insecurity and a threat of home foreclosure, like that felt by many Americans following the recession and mortgage crisis of 2008. Several characters receive feminist revisions. Above and beyond the fact that all of the young women are educated and on promising career paths, Charlotte Lou, Austin's Charlotte Lucas, Lizzie's best friend and vlog helper, enters into a profitable business partnership with the annoying Mr. Collins, who runs an internet startup. And instead of marrying him, gets a much happier ending than Austin gives her. Charlotte becomes highly successful in her career and gains financial independence. The Lizzie Bennet Diaries plays with narrative conventions, social media, and internet culture, while referencing Jane Austen's novels and past screen adaptations, and commenting on the role of media in daily life and social interactions. Using social media platforms, this adaptation of Pride and Prejudice incorporates supplemental bonus features and its own spin-offs that help flesh out the characters and provide a more omniscient narration than Liz Lizzie's vlogs are able to offer with their necessarily limited perspective. The web series creators described the Lydia Bennett channel on YouTube featuring vlogs by Lizzie's boy crazy little sister as a spin-off. In her videos, Lydia encourages her viewers to su subscribe to her channels as well as follow her on Twitter, Tumblr, and Facebook. Jane Bennett, Lizzie's kind and beautiful older sister, has a promising career in fashion, where she blogs about what she blogs about on Tumblr and discusses on Twitter, as though she were a real young woman utilizing social media to build a career. These social media accounts appear so authentic that they could easily be mistaken for the creative work of real people were an internet user to come across them without context. Occasionally in the episodes, Lizzie acknowledges comments from viewers on YouTube, and other characters respond to tweets from followers on Twitter. The producers created an immersive experience that fit neatly within viewers' social media browsing habits and news feeds. This was particularly effective for viewers who followed the story in real time as it unfolded online. Certain moments in particular allow the audience to appreciate the overt intertextuality of the Liz Lizzie Bennet Diaries. In episode two, Lizzie refers to herself as one might in a proverbial singles ad. She says, I like Rain, classic novels, and any movie starring Colin Firth. The reference to Firth immediately alerts the audience with postmodern irony that Lizzie, like them, is a fan of the actor who famously portrayed Mr. Darcy, even though it makes no sense within the narrative that Lizzie Bennet could have seen an adaptation of Pride and Prejudice. This allusion to Firth's portrayal of Darcy and subsequent association with Pride and Prejudice aligns Lizzie with her audience while maintaining the illusion that she is a real person, simply documenting her life on camera. This conceit returns in episode four after Lizzie and her sister Lydia have met a fellow named Darcy. Wondering whether Darcy is his first name or last name, Lydia comments, wasn't that Colin Firth's name in that chubby Zellweger movie? Lizzie responds to this veiled allusion to Bridget Jones's diary, a loose modern reimagining of Pride and Prejudice, saying, I do love that movie. In other words, Lizzie claims to love a movie that is roughly based on Austen's novel and, like the Lizzie Bennet diaries, is constructed as a narrative in the form of a diary. In Lizzie's narrative, it is as if Pride and Prejudice does not exist. Although she alludes to an awareness of Colin Firth and Bridget Jones, the reference merely offers an inside joke for fans without violating the closed narrative. 
I then go on to talk about um, visual tropes uh, that are borrowed from other film adaptations from the 1995 BBC series and from the 2005 Pride and Prejudice directed by Joe Wright and the ways that Lizzie Bennet Diaries borrows certain visual features and alludes to things visually um, to help engage fans. And um, it's now it's time for picture time. So um, as you can see, a couple of screenshots here from at these adaptations at the top is from the Lizzie Bennet Diaries. And you can see an example of their heads being chopped off like I referred to before. Um, and there's a comparison there to the 2005 adaptation. The Lizzie Bennet Diaries has engaged, in, excuse me, has engendered fan fiction of its own. Not fan fiction related to Pride and Prejudice per se, but specifically related to the Lizzie Bennet Diaries. For these fan fiction writers, it is as if the original novel does not exist. When, for instance, these stories describe secondary characters such as Charlotte Lou or Darcy's friend Fitz, Austin's Colonel Fitzwilliam, they do not resemble Austin's character beyond the role they play in the plot. These characters function in the Lizzie Bennet Diaries as they do in Austin's Pride and Prejudice, but they have lives and identities independent from those Austin imagined. Fan fiction writers have then taken these identities and expanded upon them further so that they resemble independent characters that reflect Austin's intentions in only an attenuated manner. Comments from YouTube viewers reveal both viewing habits and what audiences enjoy most about the Lizzie Bennet Diaries. In addition to Lizzie's wit and charm and the clever modern twists that make sense of a familiar story in a new medium, it is the romance and handsome men that viewers most enjoy. Darcy does not appear in Lizzie's vlog until episode 60, more than halfway through the series. The comments from viewers watching the series as it was released show that they had been clamoring for him to appear for weeks. As Darcy's first appearance drew closer, YouTube user Megalissa commented on episode 56, seriously, we're all dying to see Darcy. And there are six excl exclamation points there. Another user commented about how her anticipation was building my heart actually skipped a beat when I saw Charlotte's shadow. I thought she was Darcy for sure. Leading up to his appearance, Lizzie acknowledges her viewer's desire to see Darcy for themselves, ref referring to the comments just as an actual video blogger might. As the comments and view counts reveal, the audience was not disappointed when he finally did appear. The episodes in which Darcy appears have received a much higher number of view views than any others in the series. As of this writing, most of the episodes have received around 700,000 views. However, episode 98, in which Lizzie and Darcy finally kiss and express their affection for each other, has double the average number of views. Viewers express in the comments posted to these videos their desire to rewatch these favorite moments. The romantic episode 98, in which the couple declares their love, boasts nearly 11,000 comments. For comparison, most episodes have received under 1,000 comments. Many of the comments on episode 98 are expressions of joy that the two characters have finally come together. Avid viewers express their approbation for the episode by describing how many times they have rewatched it. For instance, one user colorfully claims, I swear I've watched that kiss so many times over the last eight months that I'm pregnant with their child. The ability to comment on individual episodes on YouTube in this way allows the audience an opportunity to turn their reception of the web series into a performance. The audience can respond to the videos, express opinions, ask questions, and enter into dialogue with fellow commenters. By doing so, viewers share a communal act and turn viewing into an engaged performative experience. Furthermore, the use of social media for storytelling resonates with an audience accustomed to performing subjectivity through these mediums in their daily lives. 
the use of these social media platforms is expressly performative, and the creators of the series utilize them so as to encourage the audience to engage with the storytelling in performative ways. As a means to more personally connect to the storytelling and characters, viewers suspend disbelief, wanting to forget the characters are not real, or at least to play along. Transmedia storytelling allows for this in ways that traditional screen adaptations do not. One commenter addressing Lizzie directly write, writes, I love your dress, smiley face. Where did you buy it? As though Lizzie herself might respond. Although during the course of the production, Lizzie did not reply to user comments on YouTube directly, she occasionally referred in general terms to viewer comments within the vlogs. The real possibility that Lizzie could respond fueled the suspension of disbelief and desire to play along demonstrated by viewers. Whereas some types of comments from viewers are directed toward the producers, comments addressed to fellow viewers are intended to display appreciation and understanding. By commenting with a display of appreciation for references and allusions to the original novel or to other adaptations, viewers share with others their competency within the knowledge community. Regarding episode 60, in which Darcy first appears, one user writes, love how this entire episode is one big quote from the various book and movies of it. It is perfect. Another user notes, just discovered this series through Tumblr and I cannot stop watching, but oh my god, this scene is exactly like the 2005 adaptation with Kara Knightley, and that's my favorite version of PNP. Adaptations must, in essence, be intertextual, but especially in the case of a text such as Pride and Prejudice, any new adaptation must necessarily be aware of the indelible impression that past renditions have left on audiences. As one commenter says, I thought I'd hate Darcy in this because Colin Firth is Darcy in my mind, but I thought he was brilliant. Occasionally, YouTube viewers make comments that suggest scenes or moments they would like to imagine or see in the adaptation. This convention resembles commenting practices used on fanfiction sites to encourage and prompt writers. One user comments on a parallel between a scene in which Lizzie dances around and plays with a rolling desk chair and a moment in the 1995 BBC adaptation in which Darcy emerges from a bath and while toweling off glances through a window and sees Elizabeth on the grounds playing with a large dog. Another viewer, Becky, agrees with her. That's exactly what I was thinking. Now they just need to show us the clip of Darcy getting out of the shower and watching this with a hint of a smile on his face. You know, in homage to the movie, of course. And we need a lake scene. Making a comment like this not only performs the commenter's affinities, but also allows others who are familiar with the 1995 miniseries to appreciate the point being made. As these comments reveal the visual aspects of this adaptation, both real and those supplied by fans' imaginations, are as crucial to the audience's experience with enjoying this telling of the story of Pride and Prejudice as in other adaptations, despite the fact that the Lizzie Bennet Diaries is rather visually static because of its setting as a vlog. For fans of this web series, the roughly eight hours of videos offers elements readers love about Pride and Prejudice humor, romance, Lizzie's cleverness, Darcy's awkward yet handsome appeal. Fans rewatch, create GIFs, and make screen captures. They write fan fiction, making archontic works to complement this already archontic adaptation. Fan study scholars are frequently concerned with the question of what delineates the boundaries of fan fiction. A text such as the Lizzie Bennet Diaries challenges traditional understandings of fan fiction. It is an adaptation, but it is also its own text, which has both added to the archive of Austen's Pride and Prejudice and is now involved in the ongoing creation of a new archive. 
This is an archonta creation that has taken on a life of its own. Thanks for listening. Um, I will now take a look and see what kinds of comments have come in as I was reading. Hello, friends. Let's see. Um, LSU Press has commented that if you haven't watched the Lizzie Bennett Diaries, it is a lot of fun. It is very true. Um, it's the, the short videos are a nice format um, and you can dole them out over time. It, it's, it's well done. It's got a nice production quality and uh, the, the actors are really charming. All right, here's a question. Wow, what a great question. What do you think the future holds for the Jane Austen fandom? Well, it's not going away anytime soon. We've definitely seen that there are there are moments that are um, that, that where there are clear punctuations in this fandom where you know the 1995 BBC adaptation really spawned a whole reinvigoration and in interest in Austen and a whole slate of additional spin-off novels and um, lots and lots of fan fiction. Um, so there are moments in which something new propels new interest. Um, we're seeing that right now with this, the Sanditon adaptation. Um, Sanditon was Jane Austen's unfinished novel. She left us about 11 chapters and it was ad adapted for t television. Andrew Davies, who did the, um, the, the Colin Firth BBC Pride and Prejudice wrote this adaptation of Sanditon um, and had to create a lot from scratch. And it, it, it's really spun off into its own new Jane Austen fandom, I would say. It's been very interesting to watch. It aired in the US this past spring, February and March, I think. Um, and the fandom is, is working very hard to advocate for a season two. It ended, I don't wanna give any spoilers, quick spoiler alert. It ends with a bit of a cliffhanger um, and not quite the happy ending that um, most Austen fans would be expecting of an Austen story. So that's the future I'm watching right now is this, this Sanditon fandom. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty lively fandom and has been really interesting. Um, but the more adaptations that come out, you know, we just this year, we had a new ad film adaptation of Emma. If you haven't seen that, it's an absolutely gorgeous production. It's really beautiful. Um, it's beautifully filmed. The costuming is absolutely stunning. It's received a lot of rave reviews from um, Austin purists it's really well done. So every time there's an adaptation like that, there's, there's, a, there's a spurred interest in, in, um, in Austin. But the novels themselves also just never quite lose their appeal, do they? Yes, Emily, Emily Meadows, I would think you would enjoy watching Lizzie, Lizzie Bennet Diaries. Highly recommend. I think you'd enjoy that, Emily. Ah, so another question from LSU, I just think I sort of preempted their Sanditon television series. So I will, do you, do you want my personal opinion? I actually really enjoyed it. It's not really Jane Austen. Um, it's, it's more like, I would argue it's more like fan fiction. And I think others have said something similar to that. That's not maybe, you know, a unique thought, but it, uh, it borrows some tropes from fan fiction in terms of the storytelling and the choices that they made in this adaptation. Austen, again, didn't give us very much in her 11 chapters of Sanditon. Um, and it's a fairly different work because it does center on a, on a place as opposed to on the people. Um, in, in ways that even Mansfield Park maybe doesn't. Um, but I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it on its own terms. There are lots of Austin diehard fans who absolutely hated it and had nothing nice to say about it. So it was, it created quite a division in um, amongst Austinites, I'd say. Someone commented, what an intense fandom, indeed. Um, but a lively bunch and um, everyone I've ever met has been absolutely delightful and lovely. So. If you love Jane Austen, seek out the fandom. There's all kinds of ways you can get involved in the fandom. There are online forums. There are, um, you know, Archive of Our Own is a is a place for fan fiction. There's another 
um, closed site. You have to you have to request access to it. It's called a Happy Assembly, and it's all just Jane Austen fan fiction and forums, and uh, is is quite a friendly friendly place. Let's see here. So uh, Christopher is asking, what do you think draws people, fans, to Austen's books and their multiple adaptations? So that's something I talk about in the book. I, I theorize that very thing. Lots and lots of people, lots of Austen scholars have tackled this question of why is Austen still so relevant and still so appealing, even though the world we live in is, is quite different than the world she was living in and writing about. Um, one of the things I think that I, that I talk about in the book is that um, when we enjoy a text so much, be that text a, a novel or a film or a television show, and then it ends, there's this sense of loss and we want to go back and have more of that thing. We want more Jane Austen. There are only so many novels that she wrote and we want more of it. And so we seek out new experiences to sort of recapture that initial thrill, that initial feeling and experience of, of falling in love with the novel and with characters in a world. And so people go and seek out adaptations, they rewatch them, they seek out fan fiction, they read these things, they read spin-off novels, there's dozens and dozens of spin-off novels, probably hundreds of Jane Austen spin-off novels. There's a list on the internet of, of all of them, they're, they're, they're legion. But the, the thing is, those things are all, many of them quite enjoyable, really, really wonderful, but they don't quite give us what we're looking for, and so we keep seeking. Um, and, and I refer to this as a form of what's, what's um, called by the historian uh, Joseph Roach, surrogation. We're seeking a surrogate, we're seeking a replacement for something that, that we've lost, and in this case it's this experience, and we're trying to repeat the experience, and so we keep seeking it out. But as we do, that experience fails, and so we keep trying um, and, and keep repeating the, the, the attempt. Um, so that's, that's my answer. But read the book for, for a, a longer, more articulate explanation of that. I see that Alice Burton here is, is a fan of Arthur and his toast from Sanditon. Arthur is delightful. He's quite lovely. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions. I'll give just a few more few more seconds. I know that that uh, Facebook Live has a bit of a delay. Thank you, Aaron. I'm excited for my next book too. <laughs> well, everyone, thank you so much for joining me. Um, I, it's so lovely to to see so many friends and colleagues and family members. Um, thank you again to LSU Press and to LB Kovac for, for helping make this possible. Um, Performing Jane is out tomorrow. Happy birthday Eve, Performing Jane. And, um, and there's a link on this event site to LSU's page if anyone's interested. They actually have a, a coupon code right now, a stay at home coupon code for 40% off of all of their books. Um, check out all of their titles. The press has really some just absolutely fantastic scholarship. I would highly recommend checking it out. Thank you again. Take care of yourselves.